So, so um, we raised this round, you know, last summer, and it's the first time that we, we went out with some numbers, like the valuation for the for the first time, which was north of north of two billion, and it was actually the largest round in database history, right? Like Mongo, for example, who's kind of the 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 early mover in the let's call it the the broader modern non relational database space. They raised a total of about three hundred million, like cumulatively, right? Um, and so there's a largest round in database history, which was exciting because graph databases, which is the category that we're part of and that we you know, help define and evangelize uh, at events such as Data Driven back in 2015, um, has kind of by and large been seen as like a really valuable corner of the, of the database market, but also a niche market, right? And it used to be that like people would say that, yeah, there's great technology, kick ass CEO, okay, maybe not so much that, but right, and but really just useful for social networks. That used to be the thing, right, B back in the days. And then fast forward, you know, five years, it's like, well, great technology, but really just useful for a few use cases, right? And then kind of every year, those use cases start kind of expanding, right? And of course, we have the privilege of seeing kind of all, we have kind of first basis information. So we see kind of the, the breadth of use cases. And so the perception is always lagging that kind of naturally. But so the fact that we then went out and kind of raised this, this big round uh, was one, one, kind of one of the signals that the category is truly, truly taking off. Great. Can you give us a sense for um, how, many, how many are in the company right now? Like how, how big uh, a company is it as an organization? Yeah, so, so we're just north of 600 people. Uh, I have no idea how many we were back in 2015. We actually just, earlier today, we went out with a, with a momentum release where we talked about how we crossed 100 million ARR, you know, in, you know, last year. Um, and just, just to give a flavor, I think there's, there's five, da five database companies uh, that have crossed 100 million, right, of the kind of the, let's call it the, the NoSQL crowd or like modern operational database companies. It's, you know, Mongo, and then it's us and Redis. We're on that kind of Mongo path. And then there's Couchbase and, and Data Stacks for, um, you know, maybe on a, you know, have been kind of traditionally on maybe on a little bit of a different path right now. And they um, are growing maybe at a slower pace and plateauing, right? And maybe they'll turn around and become kind of amazing back again, right? But, but it's really down to kind of Mongo and us and, and, and Redis, who's kind of in that, in that, in that cohort at the moment. Yeah. You know, why is the space um, accelerating, going from from niche to much broader uh, acceptance? So I've uh, I've seen that chart, that famous chart on DB engines, where uh, which that graph databases is like by far the, the fastest growing, um, you know, category in in, in databases. And um, I read somewhere that Gartner calls graph databases the the foundation of modern data and analytics. Uh, so what's what's happening? Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's a lot of factors that I think are contributing to and accelerating and enabling the broader shift towards an alternative databases, right? That aren't specific to graph databases, things like kind of the platform shift to the cloud. And then there's like advancements in architecture like microservices and containers that enable you to more easily swap in a new type of database stuff like that, that is as applicable to any database as to graph databases. The thing that's specific to us is this broader trend around the world is becoming increasingly connected. And the fundamental premise behind what we do is, is super simple actually. In fact, today people might even call it simplistic, right? Which is what I just said, everything is increasingly connected. Hardly a controversial statement on a Zoom call, you know, from New York, I'm in Malmo, Sweden, Right now, a bunch of people are, I'm sure, calling in from New York, but also elsewhere, probably on the, you know, in, 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 in the planet, right? And, and so everything is becoming more connected. We all know that intuitively, right? But kind of the consequence of that, that is a little bit more subtle, is that data, what is data? This is data-driven New York, right? What is data? Well, data, information, describes the real world. So as the real world is becoming more connected, data is becoming more connected. And that's neither good nor bad. That's just an objective observation of what's going on. 
But what that implies though, and what the consequence of that is that connected data exerts this massive amount of pressure on the traditional relational database because the normal relational database works with tables, right? And you can model connected data in tables. It's like you call them foreign keys and you have like a record with an identifier and then you have another record with another identifier. So Matt, you have ID three and I have ID seven and we're connected. So then it's like a three and a seven showing that we're connected. You can do it, but it's really awkward. And if you want to query along it, if you want to find patterns, how do things fit together? It completely starts breaking down. And so what we did 100,000 years ago when dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? You know, we, we came up with this concept of what's called a native graph database. So we've optimized every layer in the stack of, of, of the database architecture completely around connected data. We're not built on top of a different database or anything. It's a native architecture. Yeah. And that means that if you want to query along how things are connecting, if you want to find patterns in that, we are frequently not 50% faster or 100% faster, we're a thousand times faster. Our customers frequently tell us that we're a million times faster, right? Yeah. And so when you want to do a recommendation engine, you want to find patterns in, wait, who is Matt similar to? What have they purchased? And how are they connected and connected to the product hierarchy, right? That's typically five, 10, 12, 15 hops in a connected data structure. Like a graph database is freaking amazing at that, right? Yeah. We're and just to, to recap, just to make sure it's uh, it's it's clear to everyone. So for, first of all, graph database, like you you coined the term, right? If I if I remember correctly, uh, yeah. And that's when you started the company, in like two thousand seven or something like this. Like you're you're yes. literally at the origin of the space, which which was just your idea and has now become a whole space with like different companies and competitors and all those things. So you really pioneered um, all of this, just to put it in context. But uh, so a graph database is a database that elevates relationships as a uh, first class citizen, as opposed to just like rows and columns, like people are, are the, the, the product uh, understands how things, entities are connected to one another, right? In, in the most simple layman's term, is that, is that correct? That, that's spot on. Okay. And so what are the use cases? You just mentioned recommendation engine and I think, I think Airbnb is like a, a classic example of, of that, but like give us like a, a range of the different use cases, uh, including, you know, how Neo4j customers use the, the, the product, some practical. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so for example, you know, recommendation engines is one example. Fraud detection is another one. Capturing fraud rings. That's all about the number of transactions that individually why, why, is, okay. why is fraud a graph? For example, why? why, yeah, why yeah. Exactly right. So traditionally, you wouldn't think of it in that way, but what what all fraud detection software is doing out there is it's trying to find anomalies, right? So it would chart out. Let's say it's a, it's credit card fraud, right? You would have two dimensions. One is number of transactions. The other one is kind of dollar value per transaction, right? And then it would kind of like a scatter plot of that, right? And you would find like a band of what's normal, right? And then. Well, everything that's outside of that is an anomaly. So dear fraud detection analyst, right? Investigate that anomaly, right? Basically like that, except it's not two dimensions. It's like 19 dimensions or something like that, right? But conceptually it's the same, right? So that's great. It'll capture a bunch of different things. What it won't capture is that, what if you have a number of transactions that are all within this band of what's normal, but they're connected in fraudulent ways, like a fraud ring. Like the only way you can, find that is if you can operate and connect the data, right? And that's what graph databases do. So that's another classic use case. But then you have a bunch of other things like customer 360. How's my individual customer connected to external kind of social media, but all of my internal systems. Data lineage, right? Very important in regulated industries. Like how does an individual data item evolve over time for GDPR and compliance reasons? You, you might need to do that. Um, in you know entitlements or identity and access management, um, KYC. You go down the list. It turns out that there's a lot of use cases where the value is in how things fit together. And then coming back to your original question around why is the category taking off? And I say, well, it's because everything is becoming more connected. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Right when you and I first met in in 2015, supply chain was not a use case for Neo4j. Right? Why? Because most companies that produce physical goods, that produce stuff, right? They might have a supply chain that is two, three levels deep, right? And so if you want to 
digitalize that and analyze it, you can shove that into a classic relational database. A little bit awkward. Your engineers will have to compute some joins and whatever, but doable, right? Fast forward to today in 2020, in particular, and kind of the start of the pandemic, pandemic for sure today in 2022, any company that is producing physical goods is tapping into this global supply chain spanning continent to continent, right? That is frequently 20, 30 hops deep. And all of a sudden, if you recall last year, the Suez Canal was blocked for a week, right? And so then how does that cascade across my supply chain, right? Well, the only way you can figure that out is by digitalizing your, supp your supply chain, right? And then all of a sudden you're dealing with this deeply connected data structure. And so if we abstract that and figure out what, what's actually happened here, right? Well, what's happened is that it's exactly the same use case as back in 2015 when I was on stage in, you know, uh, 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 in New York, right? It's just that it's exactly the same use case, but the world is so deeply more connected now and therefore data becomes more connected. Therefore, it's now a kick-ass use case for Neo4j and graph databases. So this is just happening across use case, across industry, across verticals, and that's the wind behind our back. So if, I, if I'm a technology person in the company and I have like data, data problems, how do I figure out what I use for different problems, right? So you have you have key value stores, you have uh, document databases, you have relational databases, you have graph databases. How does that? How does how does that? Or how do I choose the right tool? Uh, and how does it all work together? Yeah, so it's it's actually pretty simple, right? You start with the shape of the data, and you look at the query workloads that you want to run in that data. Right, And so if that data is very tabular, if it's a payroll system and you want to record all the individuals and they're all well-structured, all of them have exactly the same schema, right? And you want to calculate average salary and blah, 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 blah stuff like that. Awesome, relational database, go, right? Or if you have a bunch of JSON documents sitting around and you don't really care how they're connected, right? Document database, go, right? Or if you have a data set that is highly complex, that is evolving, where the business requirements change, where the values in how things fit together, like a shopping cart, which is connected to order items, those order items are connected to product who sits in a product hierarchy, and how things fit together, a graph database is your best bet, right? And so, so that ends up being kind of the, the first go-to move. Look at the shape of the data and then the queries you want to run on that, and that'll clue you in very rapidly kind of where you should try, try to ev evaluate first. You, um, I think, require for to be a, a Neo4j user, you, you require people to uh, use a different language called Cypher. Uh, and uh, I'm just curious how that compares to SQL, which is really the, the language that sort of everybody knows for databases uh is that is that um so why is that a different language and um how steep is the learning curve uh, if you know sql to know uh cypher yeah so, so the big comparison is probably something like fo the following sql is old and boring cypher is new and sexy yeah that's it um no, so it's it's actually very spiritually very similar, right? It's a declarative query language, which basically means that you don't have to write programming language imperative code, depending on how technical the audience is, right? Um, but you can type it in in a very simple. You can describe what pattern you're looking for, right? And and you draw it. And some of the people who like uh, are, are older in the audience will will recall this, right? With something called ASCII art which is basically you end up drawing, like you, you draw nodes using parentheses and then with the arrows, you kind of can describe the little pattern and then you throw that to the graph database and it's gonna find that pattern and return it back to you, right? So spiritually very similar to SQL, but the really pretty astounding, one of the biggest things that have happened since, since, the, since 2015, we, it's probably a good thing for us to contrast to, to to what it was like last time we, we spoke, right? Is that um, Cypher is the most popular graph database query language, um, but 
what we've ended up doing is that we went to the SQL committee. So the committee that is standardizing SQL, right? And we said, you know what? We don't want Cypher to be proprietary just to Neo4j. Yes, today it is our key, one of our key competitive advantages to, to other graph databases out there, but the entire space is better served if there's a unified standard query language for all of graph databases. And just as a little bit of a background here, right? Every single new database paradigm since the mid nineties have gone to the SQL committee and they said they want to standardize the query language. Object databases tried that in the mid nineties. The SQL committee said, you know what? Object databases, you're just a feature of SQL. So we're going to incorporate some of your, your functionality into SQL, but that's it, right? XML databases for the, in the early 2000s, they went to the SQL committee and said, you know what, we can just sprinkle some XML syntax you know, into SQL. Document databases in the early 2010s, mid 2010s actually, went to the SQL committee and said, we want to standardize how we, you query document databases. The SQL committee, nah, you're just a dialect of SQL. We're going to spray some, some JSON into SQL. It's not needed. For the first time ever in the history of databases, the SQL committee looked at Cypher, looked at graph databases, and it said, you know what? This category is here to last. This is an actual sibling to SQL. And they created the GQL query language, which is at this point, 98% identical to Cypher, uh, our, our query language, right? And it's, again, the first time in 40 years this has happened. I think that's a, that's a pretty stark blessing around the future and, and the value of graph databases as a category. Great. So I have a, a couple of uh, questions from the audience that uh, very much cover where I was going to go next. So let's use those. So uh, first question from Balaji. Um, was, uh, a couple of questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, it says, <coughs> excuse me, there's been a flood of investments in the graph DB space. Uh, how does Neo4j Different, uh, differentiate itself and more broadly, is there opportunity for more than one player to exist? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, right? So, so a couple of things on that in terms of differentiation, right? So we're kind of the OG graph database, right? We've been around the longest and, and for if you attend Data Driven New York, you, you're probably somewhat clueful about by data. So you'll know that in, in many product categories, you kind of want to be the new kid in, in, in many ways, right? For a database, maturity, robustness, stability is actually a key part of the value proposition. So the fact that we've been around, we were the, the OG, the one that defined it and so on and so forth is actually a massive advantage because what this means is that we have by far the most robust product, by far the biggest developer community and by far the biggest reference account base. Like So most um, customers by far of all graph databases out there, right? We've also happened to have this modern, uh, which maybe sounds a little bit weird, like this native graph architecture where a lot of the more recent, as, as the graph space has become hotter and hotter, the more recent entrants, what they try to do is they try to layer graph functionality on top of their existing core, right? So they don't take the native approach, which takes forever to build, right? But that's ultimately the only way to get to the to the scalability and, and, and the performance. So that kind of speaks to the first question. In terms of, are there room for more? I absolutely believe so, right? I think this is, uh, this is an absolutely massive market. Databases is the biggest market in all of enterprise software. It'll soon be a hundred billion dollar market. I think graph databases can be a significant chunk of that, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar, right? So obviously there's room for, for more, more than one company. And uh, uh, one of Balaji's next question was um, precisely to your point about uh, established customer base. If you could share some you know, customer growth profile, like how many customers, how fast are you acquiring in, in what space, what industries, what, what verticals, anything you can share? Yeah, we have over a thousand customers in, in production right now and hundreds of thousands of developer, active developers in, in our community. Um, so that's kind of just to give you some quantifiable things, right? And then, you know, over 75% of the Fortune 100 are using Neo4j today. So all 20 of the biggest banks in North America, all 20 of them are using Neo4j. Seven of the 10 biggest retailers in the world 
are using Neo4j for the five biggest, biggest telcos. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor. 99% and this will be a dated thing because we're still in the, I guess, in the pandemic era. But I guess, uh, Matt, you were just on, a, just on a plane, right? So anyone who's ever ordered a, a flight ticket, 99% of, of all flight ticket calculations. So which route should I go from point A to point B when I fly from Paris to New York? Is that a direct flight or connecting Heathrow? Like, how do I get there, right? Is done with Neo4j. 99% of our air fare. Right, that, that's a crazy stat. That's yeah, amazing. 99%, right? And then every single room you've ever booked at a Marriott or any, any kind of uh, um, hotel that is owned by, by Marriott, right? So the Ritz Carlton and all that kind of stuff. All of that is calculated with Neo4j. So very likely you've actually used Neo4j, if not today, at, at the very least this, this week. So that gives you a little bit of flavor. Very cool. A couple of questions from uh, Gaurav. Um, first question is, Emil, who is your favorite Indian American board member of all time? <laughs> okay, so Gaurav. So I assume Gaurav is Gaurav Thule, who was yes. uh, who was on my board for the longest time, and he is with uh, with a firm called F Prime Capital, and he was for sure the MVP of my board, which I've been saying both publicly and, and, and privately. And so if any any chance, no no offense to to um, any particular VCs on this call, but if there's if you have any opportunity to raise money from uh, from um, F Prime or for that matter First Mark, I have to add right. Uh, you should go ahead and do it. All right, very good. Uh, and a second question, although graph theory as a math concept is not new, you've evangelized a new category of graph databases for a long time. That must have been lonely. Can you talk about some of the highs and lows of the journey? And now that uh, Neo and the category have made it, quote and unquote, can you talk about any secrets to category creation in the data world? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting, so, I, so I'm, I'm obviously an engineer by, by background and, and training, but I'm a I'm a student of and a, and a lover of marketing. I think marketing is is very very interesting, and category creation happens to be like one of the areas that I really love. Uh, you know, in, in in marketing, and one of the reasons that I love category creation is that it's so counterintuitive. Like, so for example, when you start out, we we coined the term graph databases right now, um, right back in the days, right. And when you when we did that, we started thinking, right, what does success look like? 10 years down the line, what does success look like? Well, success looks like we have a bunch of big companies that are competing against us. That's what, that's what success looks like, right? And you look at today and, and you see like who's participating in the graph space. It's Amazon, it's Microsoft, it's Oracle, it's SAP. It's like the entire axis of evil of enterprise software companies, right, are, are, are in the space. Like along with a, with a cohort, I mean, some, one of the previous, you know, questions alluded to, like around a cohort of younger, younger startups, right? And that's what success looks like when you do category creation, right? That, that you have a, a thriving category because if not, then you're probably not doing something that is, that is valuable enough, right? And so, so that's kind of one of the things that in the early days, you, you're just talking to everyone and you're evangelizing and all of us, like you, every single person that you, that you talk to that know graph databases and understand the value of them, you either talk to them directly or like one hop away, right? Then all of a sudden there's a tipping point where like, wait, I have no idea how this person heard about graph databases, right? And so, the, so it's starting to truly resonate in the market, right? And so I think that, that was a huge tipping point for us. And part of that is honestly, getting a bunch of competitors in, in the space, which is, which is a net positive thing for us as the leader. In the and, and together there was like persistence, so lots of talks, lots of like content creation. There's a ton of that and then a, a, a deep focus on practitioners, right? And so we go to market by winning the hearts and minds of developers, right? And yes, we love to monetize the companies where they work, right? And so we're not, but we're open source. We give it away for free. We have a free tier in our, in our cloud service, Aura DB, it's called Aura. And we have a free tier of that one, right? And we win the hearts and minds. And then they wake up and they realize that they work at one of those top 20 biggest banks in North America. And they have a problem and they have a bunch of connected data and they realize, you know what? Graph database would be a great fit for this. I played around with it you know, over the weekend or you know, in evenings and, and, and whatnot, right? And this would be a great fit for it. And that's when we engage uh, co commercially. 
And I, I think the I, other... I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, the, the other piece that, that we haven't talked about, like a real high order bit that has changed since we last spoke back in 2015, is that what I just told you is absolutely accurate, right? The fact that we are so developer-centric. But today, and this happened just in the last 12 to 18 to maybe 20, at most 24 months, data scientists are an equally, like as big of a persona for us as the developer. So if you look at kind of our top line metrics around kind of awareness or visits to neofoday.com or leads or engaged or whatever, whichever way you want to slice and dice it, like data scientists are as prevalent today as, as developers, because it turns out that the initial value prop for developers to build applications on connected data, it's as true as it ever was. And it's a massively growing thing and so on and so forth, right? But data scientists, they're increasingly realizing that, you know what? If I can extract how things are connected and use that as a signal, the relationships between data points as a signal into my machine learning, all of a sudden I can increase my level of predictiveness, right? And that didn't use to like, in, Google moved there five, seven years ago, and they, they spoke publicly about it, graph-based machine learning, right? And it's kind of true of like, right, where Google was, you know, 10 years ago is where the rest of the enterprise is today kind of a thing, right? And Neo4j is by far the best engine for that. Yeah, and so- ba ba Balaji was asking if you were leveraging graph neural networks. Awesome, yeah, that's that, that's fun. That's exactly what, what, what I'm talking about here, right? And And this is like an area where, Neo4j is very unique amongst databases. Uh, you mentioned the, the site DB Engines. DB Engines today tracks over 350 databases, right? Which is kind of crazy. When I grew up as a developer in the mid 90s, there was like four or five databases to choose from. And they were all the same, right? Like we're all relational databases. Now there's over 350. There's also like, I think there's a, a great kind of a landscape thing that some guy is posting every year. That's a great way to making sense of that. So. I don't know if you've heard of that, Matt, but yeah, people might want to look into it. Yeah. Sounds like, I, I um, don't know why one would do that. That, that sounds, sounds like a crazy thing to keep track of. But out of, and, and, and this is a pretty powerful thing. Out of those 350 databases, like developers use them and get value from them. Data scientists, they don't want to use a database. Like the only reason a data scientist go to a database is to get data out of it. They go to the database, not for value, but to get the data out of it and put in their normal machine learning tool chain, right? With exactly one exception out of the 350, one exception, Neo4j. They go to Neo4j to put data into Neo4j to be able to use relationships as a signal into their machine learning. So we built out an entire new stack called GDS Graph Data Science that is built on top of the graph database that is targeting um, machine learning and AI driven by data science. And so this is an entire new motion and persona for us. And it's a very unique thing. If you think about us kind of fast forward, you know, a couple of years, public company, we have a deep developer adoption and OLTP system of record for these core use cases in the enterprise, as well as being this essential must have ingredients for any machine learning pipeline out there in a deep developer community and data science community. That's a really powerful combination in one company. Yeah, it's a good a good place to be. Um, and just to, to 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 sort of double click to finish up on that on your go to market motion, a lot a lot of companies that we speak with, uh, you know, a lot of people want to do that open source sort of bottoms up um, effort. And uh, like in, in many ways, it feels like you're sort of wandering through the desert for 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 a long time because you talk to individual developers that may or may not want or may or may not have any budget to buy your product. At what point did you switch, um, you know, targeting the larger enterprises? Like, at, at what point, I guess, did you get a sense that this was working? Uh, and what did you do? Did you uh, build the sales force to get to the larger enterprises? Like, at, at what point do you go from bottoms up to tops down? So, yeah, if it's, ever. It's, it's, yeah, I was going to say, if, if ever, right? Like, so, so on some level, we had a bifurcated approach, right? Where we, where we built the community, right? And that is the long-term focus and the right thing to do and so on and so forth, right? But then we also went out and kind of hand-to-hand -hand comment with enterprise sales. And we tried to identify kind of for these core use cases where people have a lot of connected data today, not where they will have connected data five years from now because everything's becoming connected, but today, right? Which are really valuable inside of the enterprise 
willing to charge hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Pay hundreds of thousands, thousands of dollars, right? And then we tried to identify them. We knocked on doors through our own kind of personal network or our graph, as we like to call it, right? You know, and, and sell into that, right? But that was much more to kind of see the community, get some of those anchor lighthouse accounts and stuff like that, right? So we had a bifurcated approach like this in the early days. About five years ago, probably around the time for Data Driven New York, at that point, we had shifted. So over 85% of our ARR back then, and still true today, originate with an individual practitioner. It used to be an individual developer. Now it's an individual developer or a data scientist who founders used one of the free SKUs, be it the on-prem kind of community edition or the free tier in the cloud, right? Played around with it. And then over time realized, oh, I want to put this in production. And then there's like an entire monetization fans and a path for them, a PLG path for them in the cloud. And then all kinds of monetization triggers to shift them over to the enterprise edition on the on-prem, right? And so that's all like a bottom up motion. And then we have some air cover. We don't sell top down ever. We don't go in and knock to see on a CIO door and sell top down. We do provide air cover there through GSIs, right? Through some of the Gartner quotes that there's an endless list these days of massive um, validation for the category as a really deeply strategic investment uh, for any Fortune 500 company. And so that really helps. Um, but the bottom up um, way of going to market is still the, the fundamental um, way that, the way that we take it to market. All right, one last question since we're over time, but this is fun. A uh, question from Tony Bear. Uh, as the cloud change your addressable customer base compared to the on-prem days? Oh, to totally, right? Like, so if you think a little bit about what we did in the early days, right? Like is we, we, we broadcasted the value proposition of graph databases towards developers initially, and then more recently to data scientists. And where, data scientists where? Data scientists and developers everywhere. Any geography, any size company, hobbyist, professional, like wherever they were, right? And then because we had in the, in the on-prem world, because I think that was the question, how's the cloud change things? Like in the on-prem world, we then monetized a very thin slice of that, which is specifically you're at an enterprise company, global 2000 company. You have a use case that is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have access to that type of budget. You're in North America and Europe, right? That's where we monetize kind of in the, the on-prem world. So very thin slice of this broader awareness that we, had, that we had created, right? With the cloud product, of course, all of a sudden we have a free tier. We have a really cheap, you know, tens of dollars per month type low end offering all the way the entire kind of spectrum all the way up to million dollar mission critical deal for it for an enterprise that is globally available right and so now all of a sudden that that entire none of those constraints are true it's all all geographies it's all sizes of companies not just global 2000 but mid-market and small all the way down to individual developers so that's a massive tam expansion just on the developer side and then you add um, data scientist on top of that. And that's a, that's a really big slice of the overall data pie. All right, wonderful. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, quarter past midnight, your time. You're, you're re remarkably awake and energetic. As, uh, it's called coffee, my friend. Yes, exactly. Well, that's, that seems to be working. This, this conversation brought to you by Red Bull and, <laughs> and coffee. <Exactly. laughs> All right, this was wonderful. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's so cool to uh, see the journey over the last few years. And, uh, you know, it's only uh, just begun, my friend. Yeah, it, it feels like it, right? It feels like you're yeah. tackling a uh, a market that was already super large and that's in the process of becoming gigantic. I mean, if it becomes the, you know, the, the cornerstone for like machine learning, that's like as big a mega trend as it gets. Um, so uh, fantastic progress. Thanks for coming back and telling us a story and we'll, we'll continue to uh, root for you. And, uh, you know, maybe by the next uh, data driven, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll come back as a, as a public company CEO. That would be a lot of fun. Sounds like a plan, my friend. All right. Thank you so much, Emil. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone for attending and sticking uh, around. 
uh, for this entire session. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you at the next one, which will be uh, on February 22nd or 23rd, I believe. So uh, stay tuned for the exact date and uh, look forward to the next one. Thanks, everyone.